Good morning and welcome to the Green Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. We began our worship this morning with a prelude played by Wanda Griffiths, our Minister of Music. Thank you, Wanda. We're so glad to have you with us this morning through whatever screen you may be using to join us. I'm your host, Emily Kerlinski, and as you may already know, Pastor John McClarty has retired as of the end of 2020, and we are currently in the process of conducting a pastoral search. But until that, until that role has been filled over these next few months, we will be having a number of guest speakers that will be joining us each week. And you will also be seeing either me or Scott Callender or Erica Orban on the screen each Sabbath morning, welcoming you to the live stream and also sharing announcements and so on. And speaking of announcements, we're going to go now to Wanda Griffiths, who has a few birthday greetings to share. Good morning. I'm happy to provide some birthday greetings this morning. The first one uh, goes to Quinn Wilbur, who is um, turning, actually, I don't know the year, but we celebrate Quinn's uh, birthday today. And um, when we're in the space, I always enjoy hearing about how much he enjoyed the organ music and gets very active uh, when that music is playing. So I'm really happy to share that information. Also, we have um, Jody Loving. We're wishing a birthday, uh, happy birthday to her today. And um, very happy to say hello to you. We haven't seen you in a while, uh, but uh, we haven't seen anybody in a while. Um, Jody lives on Bainbridge Island, as I understand. So then, uh, let's see, I have one more birthday, and that would be Jenny Bolajak. Hamilton. So happy birthday to Jenny. We've gotten to work together with um, on weddings at a while back when, when you were a wedding coordinator and I enjoyed your organization and your, your good work with uh, couples coming to the church to be married in our beautiful space when that was possible. 
Um, so I think that is all the birthdays that I have. Oh no, I have one more, one more. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. Lucille Bertoff. Lucille sings with a choir and uh, I'm so happy to wish Lucille a birthday, a happy birthday this week and say hello to you and that we miss seeing you in person and in the loft. So I think now I'm back to Emily for some more announcements. Thank you, Wanda, and happy birthday, too, to anyone else who has a birthday that we don't have on our list. If you'd like to make sure that we know when your birthday is, you're always welcome to share that with us. If you go to greenlakesda.org and click on contact, you can send us a note there. Before we go into our worship service this morning, I have a few more announcements to share with you. As I already mentioned, Pastor John McLarty has retired, and we are taking an opportunity over this uh, next little time period here to celebrate John and his wife, Karen and their many years of ministry for Green Lake Church. If you are on our church email list, you will likely have already seen an email inviting you to the special tribute page that has been set up for John and Karen, a place where you can record a short message and have it uploaded there. And I just wanted to mention there are two options on the tribute page. One option allows you to leave a private message and the link for that message will only go to John and Karen to view. Or if you'd prefer to leave a more public message, there's an option for that as well. And if you choose to do that, the link for that will be sent uh, to John and Karen, of course, and then also to others who are participating by leaving a more public message. And just to clarify, when I say public, uh, in this case, I'm not referring to available to the general public. This is not like a video that goes up on YouTube where anybody can view it and comment. Um, this would be only the, the community of those who are also sharing tributes for John and Karen. If you have any questions about any of this, you're always welcome to reach out to Tad Ishikawa. He's coordinating this and he can answer any questions that you might have. The last day to share your tribute is February 3rd. So mark that in your calendar. If for some reason you haven't received the link to the tribute page, but you'd like to make sure that you're able to share something, you can always contact the church offices through our website, greenlakesda.org and click on contact. And again, that deadline is February 3rd. And in addition to the tribute page, there's also an opportunity for you to contribute to a farewell gift. You can do this through our website, click on the link to give at greenlakesda.org, and you will see there a list of the usual funds and projects that we have. There's tithe and various uh, offerings, and uh, among those things in the list, there is a menu item called pastoral farewell. So you can choose the amounts that you want to put in and submit your gift online, or if you prefer to give offline, that's also an option, of course. As I mentioned earlier, we have a number of guest speakers that will be joining us over these next few weeks. And next week, our speaker will be Elder Doug Bing from the Washington Conference, and he will be leading out in a communion service. Next week is Communion Sabbath. I'm mentioning this now in case you would like to come to your screen next week prepared with some sort of communion food and communion beverage. And traditionally, when we're sharing communion together in person, an unleavened wafer is served along with grape juice but we would encourage you to participate at home with whatever you find appropriate and whatever you have on hand. As for other traditions that we would normally share in person, I also want to mention that today is the second Sabbath of the month, which means this would normally be our fellowship dinner. We would normally be getting together and eating, but uh, since we're not able to do that, what we're doing instead is right after the postlude today, there's an option for you to click on a separate link, not this same link, not this same stream, but you can join a separate Zoom call to share fellowship dinner with us. And again, that link should have been in your Thursday email, but if, you don't, uh, if you're not able to see it there, I think we're going to try to put it in the chat here so that you can uh, view it there as well. There are a lot of other announcements that I'm not quite going to get to today, and they're listed in the bulletin for this week, and you may wanna take a look. There are prayer requests, updates on our church budget, fundraising for the Jensen House, which is part of our housing ministry, and also our children's offering that we would normally be collecting uh, on our way up to the children's story. Uh, since we're not able to do that, you can donate to the children's offering through uh, the link that's listed in the bulletin, Hands Across the Water. And this, uh, at this time, I believe uh, offerings are going to assist with an orphanage in Namibia. Uh, you can find all of these things in the bulletin. And also I would mention to you that um, if you are new to the Green Lake online community, the Green Lake Church community, and you're not sure where to find the bulletin or those kind of things, you can go to our homepage, greenlakesda.org. And if you just scroll down a little ways on the homepage, there's a link there that you can download the bulletin to follow along today. 
The sermon this week will be shared by Mindy Jones. Mindy was the head deaconess at Green Lake Church for these past four years, and she's currently one of our youth Sabbath school leaders. Mindy is also a master's student at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. Thank you so much, Mindy, for all that you have done for our Green Lake Church community. And thank you also for being willing to participate in our service today. And now we're going to move the camera back to Wanda Griffiths, our Minister of Music. She has some things to tell us about the worship music that has been chosen for today. Yes, today's music uh, comes from two previous services. Um, that's sort of an interesting feature of this time is we can sort of pick and choose from different places. So the offering music dates from June of 29, or 2018 when um, the two ringing groups, the Green Lake Ringers and the Holy Rosary Handbells joined together in a little mini festival. And uh, they presented this music, which is called What Wondrous Love Is This? Now, Shelley Legrone conducts the Green Lake Ringers and Marlene Land conducts the Holy Rosary holy rosary handbells but of course for any performance you can only have one director so for this performance Shelley Legrone is directing both groups in the Green Lake space um, so we're delighted to get to welcome them in a rerun of that production and that's why you may see some faces that you don't maybe quite recognize Marlene of course rings with the Green Lake uh, ringers and so the the two groups merge together very well to do some music that they might not get to do um, when they're operating solely with their own ringers. Uh, then the anthem this week is from uh, July of 2019 when the Green Lake singers come together in the summertime for one Sabbath and sing a song together and then we usually also have a party and so you'll notice that they are not wearing robes because it was July and it was very warm uh, but they are singing a, a favorite arrangement of ours of Amazing Grace. This is arranged by John Coates and so we hope you are blessed by that uh, song this morning. So with that I think we're ready to move into our opening hymn and this is hymn number 11, The God of Abraham Praise. So we wish you a blessed Sabbath. Please join me in the invocation. Gracious God in heaven, 
We praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness. You alone are holy, wise, generous, just, and loving beyond what we can imagine. You are our creator and our redeemer. We praise you for your presence this morning in every living room, at every kitchen table, in every car, in every place from which we may be worshiping together. Forgive our sins, Lord, and remove the distractions and barriers that keep us from seeing you as you are. Lead us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Our offering today is for the Washington youth. This is a new conference ministries offering to help grow young Adventists from early childhood through young adults. Beneficiaries include children's ministries, youth ministries, young adult ministries, Pathfinders, Adventurers, Sunset Lake Camp, and Adventist Christian Education. I invite you to support our young people who are future leaders of our communities. This will incite aspirations to serve, care, and be participative members of our society. Let's bow our heads and pray. Amidst the troubling events of this week, dear Heavenly Father, we are glad to give you back praises and adoration for keeping us safe, giving us life, health, and bounties we can share with your children. Bless every penny dropped in our virtual bucket and double the blessings that we can share more in the coming weeks, months, and years. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
fruit, delicious and new healthy. And according to the Bible, the cause of all of our problems. Ever since Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, God told them not to do that. It's been nothing but uh, hurricanes and taxes and Twitter bans ever since. You know, in our state, Washington, we have a lot of great fruit. We have the best apples in the world. I bought this in the market of our little town. It's from, it's a gala from Chelan. We also have probably the best pears and strawberries and raspberries in the world. In the summer, different countries have different fruits. All of them wonderful. And I know there's places where there's abundant fruits, very diverse, uh, just growing wild everywhere, year around. In fact, one of those places is Puente de Ixla, the tropical paradise in southern Mexico. We're here at the home of my nephew, Cafes, the veterinarian, and his uh, daughter, Houdid's going to show us around some of the fruit that they have here on their property. So, go ahead, Houdid. Hola. La fruta de mi casa son los bananas. Hola, amigos. La fruta. La fruta de mi casa es orange, y mangos, y papayas, y cañas de azúcar, y bambú, y zapotes. Y tamarín, y limones. Thank you, Judy. Um, and at this point, I also want to thank my neighbor, Cesar, for letting us film this in his place. Our house is just about 15 feet that direction behind that wall. So, uh, one little town near us, about 15, well, half an hour down the road, is kind of famous for having unique fruits. So, we're going to go there now to my favorite stand and have the friendly uh, vendor, Tomas, Give us a tour of the fruits that you're selling today. Okay, empieza. Esto se llama zapote negro. Zapote Originario negro. Originario de aquí, Jotlán del Río. Ajá. Uh -huh. Esto se llaman timbiriches. En algunos lugares lo conocen como piñuela. Maracuya. Maracuya morada. Maracuya amarilla. Son okay. dos clases diferentes. Estos son guanábanas. Son parecidas a las anonas, islamas. Las yacas o yucas, como las conocen. Ok. Estas son las mandarinas. Uh -huh. Chico zapote. Esta queda como una reliquia de aquí en Cotlán del Pueblo, donde se maduran de estas clases uh -huh. y se llaman tanguchis. Ok, tanguchis. Tanguchis. En mameis. Mamey. Ajá. Uh -huh. Gracias, muchos mameis. Todo este, all of this is from Cuatlán del Río. Cuatlán del Río. All from Cuatlán del Río. Thank you. So I'm going to be eating a lot of fruit this week. But it's all good. The papaya, the piña, the mango that I cut. This is one they call globos or mocos. And very similar is the passion fruit. This goes out where I uh, jog in the morning. The... Black zapote, which unfortunately isn't um, ripe. And probably my favorite, the mame. Doesn't that look good? Mm. Tastes wonderful. So I'd encourage you kids, if you go to the store and you see a fruit that you've never tasted and you're not familiar with, try to get one and take it home and try it. And when you um, start traveling the world, be on the lookout for fruits that you don't recognize, that are unique to that region, and try them out. It's a great way to experience this world. It's one of the best gifts to us from our Creator. So thank you, and we'll see you next week from Point of
let us pray. Dear God, this Sabbath day we come together as a church community to worship you and to thank you for your everlasting love and promise of eternal life with you. During these times of physical separation, we trust in your promise of protection and healing. We acknowledge the power of peace that you alone can bring if and when we open our hearts. As we enter this new year, we are much aware of the challenges we face within our local and worldwide communities. We bring before you leaders of our country, asking for your divine inspiration, guidance and wisdom during these unprecedented times of pain and uncertainty. Please pour your spirit of love, respect, equity and understanding among all of your children on this earth. Grant us peace and humility. Today, Lord, I ask you be with those of us who are dealing with hardships, whether concerning health, relationships, or even personal battles, knowing that we cannot face our challenges alone. I bring before you the following members of our families asking for your divine healing. Becky Mitchum, sister. David Reed. Diane Carlisle. Ed and Alma Gonzaga. Mary Churchill. Nola Jean Bambury. Rainier. Gumi Ibsen's stepdad in Iceland. We also pray for the Greenlight childcare and preschool workers for their safety in working with children. I now pray that you will be with all who are watching together this worship service, that while we may be apart from each other, your spirit may keep us united and that we receive your blessings. Be with us all during the week ahead as we live and serve others. Guide us on as we tread your path wherever we may go and in everything we do. I pray all this in your heavenly name. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Ruth chapter 1, verses 11 to 17. But Naomi replied, Why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us.
The New Testament reading is Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 to 34. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. May the Lord bless the hearing of the word. Good afternoon, fellow Green Lake Church members. Um, right now, it's not afternoon. I'm actually pre-recording this, which feels a little bit weird to me. Um, it feels really weird to me to not be able to see your faces or experience the closeness that I feel like we have historically felt at church. Uh, with that being said, I'll try to make the best of this. I'll try to do my topic justice. Um, but as I go through this, please know that you all are most certainly in my hearts and I'm thinking of you. I'm thinking of your faces. I'm thinking of how much I love you and how very much I miss you. Um, so I know that at least a few people in the congregation already know this, uh, but I'll go ahead and share it with everyone. Last January, I was accepted to the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology for their master's in the art of uh, counseling psychology. And not only was I accepted to this program, I was also accepted to the subspecialty that only accepts like 26 students every year. Um, that is uh, trauma-informed narrative therapy with a focus on uh, trauma and abuse. Uh, so I finished up my first quarter. I found it immensely fulfilling. Uh, I love learning new things. Uh, so I've, I've just really enjoyed the experience so far. So most of you who know me or who've known me for a while or know me well, know that uh, I've had my fair share of trauma throughout my life. I know that some of you who are very dear to me have shared some of your stories or at least parts of your stories with me. So I know I'm not alone suffering through some of the horrors that people experience in this life. Trauma is something that I, I really intuitively understand. And I feel like I understand this deeply inside of me because it is such a, a foundational part of my early childhood experience and my life experience. And when I kind of take a more generational look, there's me who was raised by a very traumatized mother who in turn was raised by a very traumatized mother. And now I am raising a traumatized son. So really the trauma goes back generations. And it always makes me think of that Bible verse that talks about how the sins of the father will be visited on the children up to four or five generations. So to say that trauma is kind of my thing is putting it lightly. It's something dealing with trauma and helping people deal with trauma is something that I want to make part of my life's work. So you may be asking yourself, what on earth does this have to do with today's sermon? What does it have to do with us here now in church? Before I dive in, I'd like to preface what I'm going to talk about with some facts. This church has been the most amazing and most loving church that I've ever had the privilege of being a part of. I love its members. I love the spirit it has. I will, however, be speaking in broad terms today and present some criticism about the church, not just the Adventist church, but the Christian church at large, which would be applicable to some of the Adventists. It would be applicable to Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox Christians, 
Um, with that being said, uh, I want to examine how we as a church can use a trauma hermeneutic to solve the ongoing issues that the church faces and answer some of the questions that I see being brought up uh, by some of the incredibly bright and gifted minds in my youth Sabbath school group. And ultimately, I want us to use this framework to help us to stop disassociating and find what I think of as divine connection. I think it's important before I get started to introduce a few key concepts that I've discovered over the past few months, um, largely in part from my psychology training. Um, I know that these concepts have really helped me better articulate things and provided a wonderful framework. And I want us to be able to kind of build a strong schema for things as I go along. So these concepts uh, call or, or draw on what we call liberation psychology. This is a branch of psychology that is closely related to liberation theology, which has its roots in Latin America. And those of you who know me know that my son is Colombian and that I have a, a huge soft spot in my heart for Latin America. There's an idea in this branch of psychology that we as a society have been damaged by trauma. And we play roles in this ongoing trauma. And as a society, we bear the symptoms of this trauma, not unlike the way someone would bear symptoms from an individual trauma that they have experienced. So this is kind of a new concept. Not only can we experience a personal trauma, but we can experience trauma at the cultural level. We frequently see this in minority groups. Um, I know that the book drew heavily on the book that I read uh, towards psychology of liberations, drew heavily on the experiences of African Americans who are descendants of slaves, who have obviously suffered a cultural level trauma. And that's not to say they have not suffered individual traumas, but that there is a cultural issue we have inflicted a cultural trauma on them. So there's this idea that we face cultural level trauma. And the next part of the framework is that there are three different roles that we can play. Uh, I will go ahead and use the Holocaust as an example to illustrate how these roles work, simply because that was the framework that the book uses. And I think that it uh, <clears throat> holds up very well. So if you, were alive during the Holocaust and you were put into a concentration camp, you obviously experienced trauma. So you would have been a victim. You would have had the role of being a victim. But if your entire ethnic group <clears throat> was put into concentration camps, then your cultural culture suffered a cultural trauma. Um, and so that's the role of um, victim. If you have suffered a cultural level trauma, the next um, role is perpetrator. So if you think about this, who would perpetrators be? Perpetrators would be any number of people. They could have been doctors who executed unethical experiments on individuals in concentration camps. They could have been people sending people to gas chambers. They could have even been fellow um, concentration camp survivors who were put in a position of authority because uh, having one or fulfilling one role doesn't really preclude us from playing out multiple roles. Just because we've been hurt doesn't mean that we don't hurt others. So a perpetrator is someone who inflicts trauma on others. I'm sure that we can think of a lot of other contexts where this is true as well. Now there's a third and final role, which is called bystander. Now let's say that you were someone you weren't part of the army, you weren't working in concentration camps, but you were someone who perhaps stood by as you watched people being loaded onto trains to be sent to death camps, to be worked to death or put in a gas chamber. And you said it or you did nothing in all likelihood because you would die if you said something, or you would be put on that train with everyone else if you said something. Nonetheless, you take the role of bystander. That is someone who watches something happen and does and says nothing. 
Now, the next part, I say with all the love in my heart, and I will definitely draw extensively on my own personal experience to illustrate some of my points. I, I say this once again with lots of love. Um, everyone, all of us, every single one of us, including me, have played one or more of these roles in our society. Um, I can remember still to this day with a great deal of shame the time that I played a bystander. Um, I was going to the University of Washington and I was coming home after class. I was waiting in the bus tunnel to transfer buses to go to the international district. And there was a man who was verbally accosting a same sex couple. It was two young women. And I looked on in horror and could feel every part of my body wanting to somehow interact or stop it or intercede. I thought, could I spray him with the pepper spray I have on my keychain? Would that be escalating? Would that even be appropriate? Would that be a crime? Could I put my body between him and these young girls? Or would that just escalate the situation and cause more violence? Should I say something? Why is no one else saying anything? And in an instant, my bus came and I hopped on that bus and I played the role of bystander perfectly. And to this day, I still suffer a great deal of shame. So, um, like I said, we've all played all of these roles. The interesting thing about all of these roles is that they produce symptoms. And one of the main symptoms that I kind of want to examine today is disassociation. Disassociation is not always a bad thing. I think it gets a bad rap. And I don't want to make it sound like it's always bad. I think disassociation most certainly has its place. Once again, I'll use myself as an example. When I was about 11 years old, we lived at the top of a dirt road that was about half a mile long. And I had a friend who had a little electric like razor scooter thing. He had uh, worked a summer job and and uh, saved his money and bought it and he was letting us ride it. So I'm going down the hill, it's a dirt road, the wheel hits a rock and I tumble down the hill and every part of my body hurts, but my wrist hurts horrifically. And I think to myself, I am very badly hurt and my wrist hurts really bad and I know that it's injured very badly and I know that I have to walk home from here. I need to walk maybe a quarter of a mile home. So I'm, I'm not going to look at it because I know once I see that it's like all skinned and bloody or something like that, that I'm not going to be able to hold it together. And I wanted to scream and I wanted to cry because I was in so much pain, but I just couldn't. I had to be tough. I had to pick myself up and I had to start walking home. Part of the way there, I worked up enough courage and I looked down at my wrist, my left wrist, and what I saw was my left radius and my left ulna overlapped with the bones almost poking through the skin of my wrist, but not quite. Uh, and I had a double dislocated fracture. And I think to myself, if I hadn't given myself those few moments of disassociation of like, I'm not going to look at this, could I have actually held it together and like made my way home? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I could because it's definitely very panic inducing to see your bones and configurations that they shouldn't be in. Um, so disassociation is what allows us to utilize our flight and fight response in a way that is actually productive in the way that it's meant to, to actually occur. However, just with everything else, if disassociation is taken too far, it becomes unhealthy. And I think if we look at this at a societal level, we see huge amounts of disassociation. I know my therapist likes to talk a lot about um, disassociating by binge watching 10 hours of New Girl. Um, I know he doesn't actually watch 10 hours of New Girl. He has a eight month old son, so he does not have the time to. But the point is we will binge watch things. We will mindlessly purchase things that we don't actually need we will do any number of things to kind of numb ourselves to the present reality that's going along or going on around us. For example, during this time of, of COVID, 
I have gotten really into pasta making, which is definitely a form of disassociation. And with all those carbs, I know that you all know you can definitely take pasta making too far. Now, I know in the United States that we see a lot of this um, drinking to excess, buying to excess. All of these things are a form of disassociation. And it's part of that cycle of trauma. Now, I kind of want to move into the slightly more controversial part of what I want to talk about. We as Christians, as a whole, as a collective, we have suffered a collective trauma, many collective traumas. And we, as Seventh-day Adventists, have suffered some very specific collective traumas. We have suffered the collective symptoms as well. We as Christians, and specifically as Adventists, we have played all three roles, perpetrator, bystander, and victim within our culture and within our society and within our church. My first example is when Christ first left earth after his resurrection, the church had this idea, I shouldn't say the church, the disciples who were the church at the time had this idea that his advent, his second coming, was so imminent that they would not get old, they would not die, they would not succumb to illness, that he would be back before their life ended. Well, we are now several thousand years later, and clearly that's not what happened. Generation after generation, and we are still waiting for our loving parent that we desperately want to be reunited with to come again. Instead of being reunited with our parent um, in what we think will be perfect harmony, where we won't age, where we won't fall ill, where we will no longer suffer, we have been left to live in a rather brutal world. Generation after generation, we are still waiting. And as Adventists, this has been even more profoundly impactful and even more traumatic because it's in our name. We believe so strongly in the advent. Ellen White was so much of the same mind as the apostles that she thought Christ's return was imminent, that he was coming possibly in her generation, and if not, the generation after. And yet here we are over a hundred years after her death and we are still waiting. The belief in the second coming is so central that we still carry the name Advent in the name of our religion. And yet we are still waiting. And how has this impacted us? Here we are waiting for the return of our loving parent while the world around us is falling apart and literally becoming uninhabitable in certain places for humans. The ice caps are melting. Our oceans are dying as they become more and more acidic. Our brothers and sisters face discrimination for the color of their skin or death at the hands of police officers. So our trauma has led us to becoming bystander. And our laser focus on the second coming has been a form of disassociation. If we are so for focused on the second coming, why on earth would we fight against global warming, against racism, against discrimination, why would we rage against the dying of the light in order to make this world, this ephemeral world that we are supposed to leave behind thousands of years ago, a better place? We're supposed to be caught up and taken away very soon. So why would we focus on these huge problems that we're facing now? By focusing on the second coming instead of the world that we actually live in, we have ceased to connect. Um, to the world that we're actually living in now. This has not been the only way that we have been traumatized. Um, a lot of this happened before I was born, but I, I've, I've heard about it since. In the 1980s, it was revealed that the founder of our religion, the person that we look to as a prophet, the person that was supposed to be essentially God's voice among us so that we were never left alone, was, was It was discovered that Ellen White had essentially plagiarized the majority of her work 
This left many people feeling betrayed, disenfranchised, and ultimately adrift. After these revelations, pastors and congregants alike left the Adventist church, not really knowing what to believe any longer. But how did the rest of us deal with this? Instead of looking at what actually happened, confronting it, accepting it, naming it, we doubled down and we focused on rooting out anyone in our colleges or institutions that did not accept every single fundamental Adventist belief. Somehow it became more acceptable to not look at the wound that had been caused within the church by this plagiarism than to actually address it. And so we disassociated and alienated even more people. Now, if we're gonna take a, a bigger look at things, we're gonna jump back in history a little bit. We're gonna look at the long history of Christianity and the many times that Christians have been perpetrators. We have historically commoditized salvation by numbering the number of souls that we convert to a particular religion instead of treating those people as individuals who have personal stories, personal journeys, or are personally impacted by that. I have heard this even within my lifetime so that I know that it continues to be true. This, in my mind, is a form of commoditizing salvation. We are not looking at the people. We are counting their souls as if we're putting them into a bank somehow. If we look at the face that mission work has taken on in different lands, this has gone hand in hand with colonialism. It is true now, but it has been particularly true historically. Christianity has historically been the pale face of colonialism throughout the history of North, South America, and Africa. We drove native people, people from their lands, forbidding them from practicing their traditions, their culture, speaking their language, and we lost the wisdom that they carried with them. We tore children from their parents to put in the arms of white Christians so that we could ultimately stamp out their culture and take their resources and their land for ourselves. We cramped human beings onto ships in subhuman conditions. After stealing them from their home, we took them across the ocean and sold them like cattle in what can only be described as the most disgusting form of slavery that the world has ever seen. We told ourselves a very powerful lie. We told ourselves that the face of Christ was fair, that he was white skinned, and somehow that those people that we were dehumanizing were somehow less human than us. Never mind that all human life came from Africa and that up until about 8,000 years ago, we all had dark skin. Even though we left Africa close to 20,000 years ago. The lie allowed us to essentially, the lie that, that Christ was white, that white was somehow more human, allowed us to dehumanize these people. And I think that we still carry that legacy with us now. And it is a wonder to me that we do not succumb to the burden of that shame. And I think it is because we don't really look at it we don't think of it as ours, as part of our actual history. Finally, we play bystanders as the Adventist church refuses to take an active stand and fight when we see injustice, racial injustice, when we see families being torn apart at the border, children being removed from the care of their parents, when we see inequality and we don't fight for equal rights for our LBGTQIA plus community, for those who are our brothers, sisters, and otherwise gendered siblings, we are bystanders when we as a church refuse to take a meaningful stance or action as our climate changes, heating our environment, melting our ice caps, 
or as our ocean absorb more and more carbon, becoming acidic to the point of not being able to sustain life. Every single time we treat the environment with this mindset of scarcity, of how we have to take more and more, essentially meaning that other people get less. What we're doing is we are taking on the role for ourselves, both perpetrator and bystander to its destruction. We certainly have symptoms of these roles that we have played historically, and we are continuing to play currently. Young people are leaving the church in droves because we Christians have traumatized them and because we can't actually face what we've done. We refuse to look at our own history. We refuse to equate Christianity with colonialism and colonialism with the true horror of what actually happened. We refuse to look at the brutality of our own history we have lost our connection to communities that are not a part of our small religious enclave. And because of all of this, we are facing irrelevance because we cannot adapt. We haven't been able to adapt to a world where Christ has not returned. So I ask, what can be done? What can we do? I think we can first of all think about what the antidote to trauma is, and that is connection. The antidote for being a bystander is connection. And connection is, you guessed it, also the antidote to being a perpetrator. But before we're able to create those connections that we need, we have to stop disassociating. It's time to take stock of our cultural um, wounds that we have inflicted, that have been inflicted on us. We must gather our strengths and we must look at how we have been hurt and how we have hurt others. And that's not an easy thing to do. And it often entails feeling a lot of shame. We can't continue to disassociate from that pain or from that shame or that suffering. We can't disassociate from the suffering of the world around us by focusing on an afterlife or the second coming. One of my favorite theologian, Miroslav Foff, points out that exclusion is the foundation of all sin. He says that this conception of sin is useful because it names as sin what is often passed as virtue, especially in religious circles. What is interesting about this notion is that the connection to other, that it basically cuts us off from connecting to other human beings and connecting to other human beings is what actually protects us from trauma and no matter which of the roles we are playing. If we look at things from an individual level or an individual perspective, trauma, at least to some extent, is inevitable. That's not to say that the big trauma that some of us experience is inevitable. That is not something that every human being on this planet experiences. We're not all survivors of huge traumas, but the little traumas, the little traumas, and I would say even most of us will probably experience a big trauma, such as a loss of a parent or a sibling or someone that we love. Those traumas are things that every single human being on this planet will experience from the most extreme forms to the least extreme forms. So it is our connection and our love that we have with other people that insulates us from those painful bumps along the road of life. We need those connections to others. And for those of us who have experienced extreme trauma, we have to learn that relationships are not always abusive. And that is an essential part of our recovery we have to learn that others can provide containment for us. Um, and that is a vital part of learning how to thrive and to contain ourselves. And if we're to think about containment, we could think of kind of visualize ourselves as like a little styrofoam cup and the traumas in the world is like stabbing holes in that cup. And if that cup has anything in it, it's gonna come pouring out 
So what we need is we need something around us to hold that water in, to contain us so that we can keep on going, so we can keep on surviving. And that is not something that's possible without other human beings. Trauma recovery, whether it is communal or individual, cannot be done in isolation. So what does that mean for us as a church? We need connection. We need deep and personal connection with people outside our community and with those we have traditionally othered. Wolf describes this type of relationship that is both separate and bound, encompassed by the term differentiation. So we are bound to others, but we are still ourselves. Essentially, we are to make space in ourselves for those we have traditionally driven out, and they are to make space in themselves for us. Another way of thinking about this framework is through the lens of Martin Buber's concept of I and thou. This type of relationship has really helped me form a good concept of how we as Christians are supposed to interact with the world. First, we could look at the I-it relationship. Um, this is where someone uses their senses to perceive an object or a person, someone or something. An I-thou relationship is one where the two subjects are in relationship or being with one another without discrete bounds. In an I-thou relationship, the participants relate authentically in dialogue without judgment and without goals. And I think that last part without goals is very important. They meet each other as they are, not as who or what they represent. And in Buber's mind, God is the ultimate eternal thou. In contrast, I it is a detached relationship where the I perceives specific qualities of the it, and the it is a commodity. The I-it relationships involves analysis, description, counting, perhaps of souls, and reduction. Buber was really an amazing person because he saw the divine through the I-thou relationship. He saw that God existed in those links. And I think that is how we can also see God, just as Buber did, through those I-thou relationships through the links that we have with other people. And it makes sense, doesn't it? The I-thou relationship is very representative of the relationship that God has with us. And aren't we supposed to emulate God here on earth? I'm not saying that we need to completely avoid I-it relationships. In some ways, those are essential to making the world work on an everyday level. But I do think that we need to move towards the I-thou relationship and have more of that in our lives. I know it's a rather romantic notion, but the reality is very challenging. To be able to enter into a radically accepting relationship with others where we don't attempt in any way, shape or form to make them in our own image, that's way easier said than done. Yet, it's what I truly believe we are called to do as Christians. I remember when I first learned about this idea, it was um, in a maybe about a 10, 15 minute video that I had to watch for a class. And I remember thinking that is possibly one of the most beautiful things that I've ever heard. Is this not what true connection and true intimacy looks like? But yet, have I actually ever consciously endeavored in entering into a relationship with another human being this way? Or on some level, am I always trying to make them in my image? And I'm not sure that I have, but it is something that I certainly want to do. I want to do it as a wife, as a mother, and as a Christian. And I hope that we can all do that together. This idea has been a huge paradigm shift for me and how I want to interact with the world. And I hope that it's a paradigm shift for other people as well. So the antidote to our communal trauma is to stop looking away 
to stop disassociating and to connect. We are being called to stop the foundational sin of othering and to see no, and I see no other way out of our role as victim, bystander, and perpetrator. How on earth can we stand by while children are separated from the parents at the border? Or how could we stand silently as our LBGTQIA plus siblings are discriminated against? Or as we see systematic racism that has kept families of color out of our white neighborhoods or shortened their life expectancy because of brutality and violence or long-term stress. We can no longer treat those who are outside our community as simply others. We can no longer stand by as the system causes its damage. We cannot view our church as the source of all truth and purity. In fact, Wolf went so far as to say that the pursuit of false purity and truth is a central aspect of sin. An example of which is a community setting itself apart from the defiled world in a hypocritical, in a hypocritical sinlessness. We cannot wait for the advent to come and cleanse the earth of the sinful and unrepentant. We must break down the barriers instead, the barriers between us and the world, not just as an, at an individual level, but at an institutional level. As the events of this last summer have made crystal clear to many of us, it is not enough to remove racism or bigotry at the individual level if the system is still racist and bigoted. Likewise, it's not enough for individuals to engage in I thou relationships if the church, com church and community objectifies everything. We need to end systematic objectification and adopt an I thou relationship across communities and identities. As Wolf would say, if the other is excluded and it is the system that is doing the excluding, a system in which I participate because I must survive and against which I do not rebel because it cannot be changed. Throughout history, I can't count the number of times that that's the way things have felt. And yet somehow we must find a way to rebel and not be part of the system. Somehow we have to find a way to break out of these roles and the cultural systematic level that we experience trauma. I hope that you all enjoyed this topic. Uh, reach out if you have any questions or if you want to discuss farther. And it is my dearest hope that we are all again together in a room where we can touch, where we can hug, where we can be joyous together. And until that time, my heart is with you all, and I miss you dearly. Happy Sabbath.
please join me in the benediction. Gracious God in heaven, we praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We praise you for this opportunity to worship together. We thank you for Mindy's message this morning. And as we await your return in these difficult times, teach us to recognize your love and to empathize as Jesus did. Teach us not to dissociate, but teach us to engage and connect with those around us, to advocate for the helpless, to be partners with those who are healing. As we go into the week ahead, we pray that you will be always at our side. As we seek to serve you, give us wisdom. Help us to see you as you are, and as we behold you, transform us that we may be more like you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today and worshiping with our online community at the Green Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm Emily Kurlinski, and I'd like to welcome you back next week at 11 a.m. In just a moment, we're going to hear once more from Wanda Griffiths, our Minister of Music. But before we do, I want to briefly remind you again that next week is Communion Sabbath, and I would encourage you to participate at home with whatever communion food and beverage you may have available. And I also want to mention again that right after this, right after the postlude, we will be having a virtual fellowship dinner over Zoom. And the link to that is in your weekly Thursday email, or you can also find it here in the chat. Again, thank you for joining us today. And at this time, we close our service with the postlude. Mm -hmm. 